All right, let's go ahead and get started. Our presenter today is Dr. Levent Kanar, Professor of Biochemistry and CBRN Medicine at the University of Health Sciences in Ankara, Turkey. Dr. Kanar's presentation is titled Clinical Response to a Clinical Approach to Chemical Warfare Injuries. All right, Dr. Kanar, I will pass it off to you. Thank you. So, okay. Uh, first of all, I'm Professor Dr. Levent Kenner. I'm the Spesiburum Professor, means the Chemical, Biological, Radiological, and Nuclear. And also, I'm the Professor of the Biochemistry. And now I would like to wish you my best uh, greetings from Turkey. Now it's uh, 9 o'clock p.m. here in Turkey, but I'm sure that you are in the lunch time. So I'm sorry for uh for your lunch so anyway today's topic will be about the the chemical warfare injuries which is uh, the agenda of today's uh, world and mainly we are going to focus on the clinical approach to the chemical warfare injuries i mean we are looking to the chemical warfare injuries from the medical perspective and how we can recognize the the injuries and how we can treat and give the first aid to such chemical warfare victims. First of all, I would like to start. And if you have any questions, please just stop me and you can ask what's coming to your mind. No problem. I would like to, first of all, <clears throat> make the definition of the, what is the chemical warfare agents. So uh, it is under the concept of the CBRN, chemical and biological, radiological, and nuclear. So this is just, uh, just, uh, symbolized as the weapons of the mass destruction. and But the chemical warfare agents specifically are the chemicals which are highly toxic chemicals and which are used for the, for not on the purpose, for the not purpose of not to kill the or injure the people, but also to contaminate the living organisms, including the plants and the food sources or the, the water sources. And also, uh, also to to render the non-functional targets, uh, especially the with the economic importance, and also to reduce the mobility and the uh, livability of the people by forcing them to use the protective personal protective equipment and masks, and also this threat or the occurrence of this chemical warfare use may also cause some terror and panic on the public. Just uh, if we uh, clear, uh, classify the chemical warfare agents according to actions of the mechanisms, the main WAs are the, the nerve agents, which are very similar to the organophosphate uh, chemical. And mainly the taboon, GF, VX, and Novichox are the main which are uh, easily encountered uh, during that time. And the other uh, chemical warfare agents are the choking agents, which are also lung damaging agents. Phosgene and chlorine are the main examples for this classification. And the other important thing is the, the riot control agents. And for example, phenane uh, is the one example for that. And the other one is the this vesicants, or uh, also they can burn the, the skin, especially uh, the respiratory system, sulfur mustard or nitrogen mustard, levicide. And the blood, these are the systemic toxic and cyanide is a good example for that. And the hallucinogens, which are also incapacitating agents, B is uh, the very uh, most widely known uh, hallucinogen from this classification. And according to the, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is under the uh, authority of the 
OPCW means that Organization for the Prohibition of the Chemical Weapons. And the center of this agency is in the, in the Netherlands. There is a long convention and also there is a list of this, which is a and namely we can just create the schedule one, two, and three according to the the severity and the possible use uh, of the toxic chemicals and the precursors. And uh, CW just recently announced that the, the declared chemical weapons all around the world or the stock of this chemical weapon uh, have been all destroyed. And it was announced uh, the, 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 this year's uh, July. But a chemical warfare and have uh, immersely uh, acute effect on the on the body and on the tissues, and a secondary contaminant consequences, uh, which means that I mean, if the the first responder or the the medical staff is trying to give a response without knowing that the uh, the injury is due to the chemical weapons. So the person or the, this first responder can himself be contaminated because of that toxic chemical. Really manufactured because uh, under the very, uh, very primitive laboratory conditions. And the contamination is an important issue uh, for, the, uh, for the first aid against chemical warfare. And when we compare with the biological weapons, biological uh, warfare agents, they are relatively easy. They are approximately under different types of the chemical detectors to identify the use of this uh, CW. And if we look at some important properties, for example, they are mainly found in cases or in war. And so, I mean, this warfare agents may dissolve as the in water and organic solvents, and their this property also lead them to be used in some certain decontaminating solutions, and also the race and the gender and the age of the people also have also effect on the which type of reactions things or the human bodies are giving as a reaction to such different types of the chemical warfare. And the inhalation or the main route of the dispersion and after the absorption of the, after the inhalation of the agent, especially through the upper respiratory tract and it can also penetrate, they can be penetrated uh, by means of the surface of the, the liquid and solid particles and of course skin and the mucous membranes are also other main for the roots of the export. And gastrointestinal system is another way to be absorbed for these agents, especially after the contamination of our drinking with waters and, and the foods that we And also we may get this chemical warfare agents, especially our uh, uh, I mucosa, and also uh, I told that they have so the long term effects and the chronic diseases, and they cannot uh, be expected. And the carcinogenesis and mutagenesis is one of the consequences, especially in the long term uh, duration. And the infants maybe be it may be. Uh, the combination of the the foods and the environment and also the the agent itself can also make some uh, suppression on the uh, on the leukocytes and on the other um, hematologic parameters which can also prevent us to get uh, from the infection and ecological impacts and environmental impacts are the other uh, source that we can get harm from the chemical warfare agents. So as you see on the slide, there is a long list and in from the historical perspective. Uh, 
And the main uh, use, I mean, in, in the modern era was ha happening in the First World War. So approximately 1 million and 300 people were injured because of this chemical warfare agents. Although the, the chemicals were the, the fathers of the chemical warfare, like the, the phosgene and chlorine gas and the mustard agent. And it was all tried uh, in the First World War. And what about the Second World War? World War. So it's it was not used um, effectively, but the gas chambers in in in, the, in Nazi camps, and also the in nerve agents were also produced were synthesized during the World uh, Second World War. And the Iran Iraqi War in 1980s. So uh, more than uh, five thousand people were killed because of this chemical warfare agents. And in Tokyo subway station in Japan, especially showed us that these chemical warfare agents might have been also used in terrorist purposes. And in that situation, uh, in 1995, and 12 people were dead, and more than 5,000 people were injured because of the, the sarin and one of the nerve agents attack in the metro the subway stations in Tokyo. And one of the things also when we come to our recent times, so the Syria, this in in more than 160 times the chemical weapons were attacked in especially in the northern Syria. Especially I just put the names of the, the master attack in, in, in 2015 and the master chlorine attack in Kharkiv and and in Bab, in in this and the mixture of the sarin and chlorine gas, uh, and also the other types of the sarin and chlorine gas in uh, 2017s and 2018s, and I just put this specifically because me uh, and my team were uh, conducted some medical interventions and medical uh, exercises for the injuries which were also evacuated from the, the Northern Syria to our Turkish hospitals. So that's why we have just uh, uh, experienced too much from this chemical, the real chemical war uh, casualties. If we just summarize the, the effects and the other, the signs and symptoms of the of each types of the chemical warfare, for example, nerve agents, so then, they may be classified the G and V types of, of agents. As I said, these are very uh, similar to the organophosphorus insecticides and the chemical structure. And from that agents, especially uh, the, the G types of agents are the non-permanent character. But when we compare the V types of agents and inovichox are generally uh, showing a persistency, a higher persistency. So that's why the penetration of the, of the V agents, especially through the skin and through the other uh, membranes, is almost faster and more toxic when compared with the, with the G type. So the taboo is the, uh, the historical nerve agent, the, which was the synthesized for the first time. So it's 20, uh, sorry, 30 times more toxic when compared with the first gene. And it's also more toxic or than the sarin, especially from the duration of the duration time and the stabilization on the on the ground. Sarin is the, the most popular nerve agent and and widely used and also also widely uh, stored and widely uh, synthesized, produced all around the world. So it's colorless liquid. And, and its vapors are also colorless. So you cannot see any kind of indication of the serene use because it's, as I said, the colorless and there is no vapor and just, it's some, something like, a, like a, a, a glass of water. So you cannot differentiate it. It's really an nerve agent or just the water. And it's also a, a little chemical substance and its detection is very possible with the chemical detectors. And SOMA is another nerve agent and it, it can easily infiltrate, it can easily uh, just uh, dive into the central nervous system. So that's why it's the, the most dangerous uh, from this nerve gases classification. 
And another one is the cyclosarin, at a very similar uh, configuration from the chemical side, uh, like the serine uh, nerve agent. And the VX is, is one of the very popular, especially was used many times in the last 10 years uh, in various um, events uh, related for the chemical warfare agents. So it's much more permanent than the G substance, G types of the nerve agents, and its absorption through the skin and, the, and through the respiratory system is very fast when compared to the G type. And the one thing that I have to mention here, just you just you shouldn't trust the, the, the normal surgical gloves, especially for this nerve agent types, because they can per give the permission. And instead of that, so the the gloves uh, which is uh, produced by from the mid beetle rubber polyester, it's more uh, logical to use surgical gloves uh, to prevent our hands from the the chemical uh, warfare agents. And one other one other thing from the VX that this is also uh, very easily penetrating and it can be just uh, stable on the ground or on the surface of any equipment uh, more than a week. And the Novichok is the fourth uh, class or the fourth uh, generation nerve agents. And it, the, this is the, all the, their LD50s uh, are almost lower than the uh, VX. So it, it just uh, it mentions that the it's the very powerful and very toxic and nerve agents when compared with the others. So the main uh, action mechanism is just these uh, nerve agents are inhibiting the uh, acetylcholinesterase, the enzyme which is used just to, to uh, which is uh, found located at, at the nerve endings. And then uh, when the enzyme is activated, it is uh, it breaks down the choline and the 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 acetyl acetic acid into two parts. So that's why when it is inhibited uh, at the, at the, uh, in in the action of the nerve agents, so the acetylcholine is not broken down, and it's a very important neurotransmitter between the the nervous uh, nervous cell and the other postsynaptic cells. So that's why after the uh, inhibition of this enzyme, we can see the, the classical symptoms, signs and symptoms of the nerve agents. And the main nerve agents effects, especially the mus musconic effects, when you are exposed to a nerve agent, the meiosis is the main and, and the patognomonic uh, signs that you can see or the, that, that the, the medical people can see. This is the, that's the pinpoint uh, meiosis, the, the pupil construction is easily and uh, seen by the uh, during the physical examination. And because of that, the blood vision and the rhinary and the reclamation and the bronchial secretion increase and the shortness of the breath and the, the uh, occurrence of the, the pathological growls and pathological sounds in during the auscultation and salivation and sweating and the hypermotility and bradycardia are the main symptoms of the nerve agents. And in other terms, it's called as the sludge, which means that the salivation and lacrimation, urination and diaphoresis and GI distress and mazes. And nicotinic effects are the other uh, effects of the nerve agents, like the muscle fasciculations and muscle twitching and paralysis are the main uh, nic nicotinic effects of the nerve agents. And if the person is not treated uh, very well of the, and the person is still uh, continuing to get exposed to the nerve agents, so if there is no any medical uh, intervention and, and the first aid, so the person can have the uh, some longer uh, uh, effects of the nerve agents, which means that the central effects. So it means that the the our central nervous system is under is uh, is in dangerous. So the loss of consciousness, the cyanosis, and hypertension, convulsions, taxia, and some difficulties in speaking, 
and of course the depression of our respiratory center as after that the death unfortunate is expected if there is no treatment so some important points here we can say first of all we have to just the respiratory system uh, we have to correct the respiratory system imbalance with the oxygen and of course the atropine and anoxime this is the important uh, antidotes for the nerve agents and their life-saving antidotes, life-saving interventions. And if there is any convulsions, also diazepam or midazone are the important uh, uh, anticonvulsants that should be applied. And when you get, uh, when you see the, the patients uh, tearing with the blood vision and the, the pain in the frontal area and behind the eyes, and chest tight, chest tightness, and the uh, and the coughing, and all, and the runny rolls. So we can see that say that the patient are in the uh, are under the exposure of the chemical of the nerve agent. So it means that uh, we have to just initiate the atropine and oxime antidote uh, intervention. And if available, of course, there is specific uh, auto injectors, which consist of uh, two milligram uh, atropine sulfate and the, the various uh, quantities of the oxime preparations. So it can be administered intramuscularly. And also we have to monitor the ECG and the pulse and the blood pressure. We have to keep the airway open. And if if there is a an, an necessity, so we have to make the aspiration and the, we have to just uh, open the airway and the, the intubation and then and open a vascular uh, access and also the also person should be also monitored for uh, at least uh, a day. And atropine is able to correct the muscarinic symptoms, especially with the secretions, and it's ineffective for the nicotinic symptoms. Also, it does not correct the meiosis that we have to also know about it. And for each uh, five minutes or three to five minutes, we have to make this atropine injection. And if there is an hypoxia, so uh, uh, we have to just avoid from the intravenous uh, administration. And one thing also that I have to declare here, uh, you shouldn't use the the uh, the poopy size or the heart rate uh, as the criteria for the effectivity and the uh, of the atropine and also the time to discontinue the atropine uh, injection. What is the criteria to stop the atropine injection if we if this if you can see the dry in the, in the mouth of the patient, or if you just with the auscultation if you just think that uh, or hear that the disappearance of the rays the the pathological sounds in the lungs. So you can just discontinue, you can just stop the atropine injection. Also, one thing is, I mean, the, the blood, uh, sorry, the, the heart rate, if it's more than uh, 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 100 or more than 120, so you have to also stop the atropine injection. And oxime is it's just to, to liberate, just, uh, you know, the uh, nerve agent is uh, just inhibiting the cholinesterase enzyme and um, by in making the injection with the oxime we are just trying to remove the nerve the nerve agent from this enzyme so we have to just uh, keep our eyes about uh, the aging times for each which is specific for each type of the nerve agents for for example for the serine it is uh, starting from the four to five hours and for the vx up to the uh, 60 hour but but when it's soma so we have to make the medical intervention as 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 uh, quick as possible. And the uh, the oxime preparation may also change according to the regulation of each country. For example, for our Turkish regulation, the uh, two hundred and fifty milligram uh, uh, of oxime is available for the uh, auto injectors.
And vesicants is another types of the chemical warfare agents, which is also mainly used uh, in the historical times. Also, it's uh, stored in a very huge amounts in the uh, throughout the world. And the main thing is, of course, it uh, it's it's a very uh, it's a, it has a smell which is similar to the mustard or the garlic. But the main action of the mechanism is it uh, just kills the cells. And because and it has a cytostatic and mutagenic action and that's why it's one of the most feared and used chemical agents because of its is it's easily and in in cost effective production and its penetration through the skin has a very high and it has also some irreversible effects and long term effects and complicated symptoms which we can see especially about uh, uh no, Thirty thousand uh, victims, which remains from the Iran and Iraq uh, chemical war, and the main signs and symptoms of the uh, master agents are the and the redness of the skin. It may just uh, starting from the retina of the skin and may also uh, go uh, beyond the necrosis of the skin tissue. And the bilious and blistering formation on the skin uh, also is a very uh, pathognomonic uh, specification of the master casualties, especially in the hot and humid climates. And then the main parts of the body are, for example, the mosty and the, uh, and the folded parts of the skin, like the groin and the armpits and the skin folds. And also the, the damage of the to the eyes and the skin the tissue and the respiratory tract are the, uh, the main signs and symptoms. And also, especially because of the, the, the suppression of the bone marrow tissue. So we can just see the very sharp decrease uh, in the local size and in the erythrocytes and platelets. That's why the people which are exposed to the mustard agents have the, a higher tendency to the infection and to the sepsis. And what's the treatment or the first state? So the photograph, the, the, the figures you see here is, is just taken from the casualties which are evacuated uh, from the uh, from Syria uh, chemical wars. There is no antidote, which uh, we can see also the antidote in Norway, but there is no antidote regime in the, in the master casualties. But the main thing is the symptomatic treatment and the decontamination. Decontamination is very important in mustard casualties. So it should be performed as soon as possible, as quick as possible. And the skin also, the, especially the drops, the, the, the mustard agents, the mustard drops should be removed uh, with a sterile clothing firstly. And after that, we just soapy water, or if it's available, sodium bicarbonate or some uh, saline uh, solution or some diluted uh, hypochlorite solution also should be applied for the uh, for the casualties, for the decontamination of the casualties of the mustard agent. The lobicide is another chemical warfare agent and its volatility is greater when compared with the mustard gas. And it reacts with many types of the enzymes, which uh, uh, consist the uh, sulfidryl groups uh, and the proteins. And the, the main signs and symptoms, which is different than the mustard agent, is the, there's a sudden uh, symptoms as soon as you get exposed to the level side. At the pain and the left response in the eyes, a burning pain and skin. And hemolysis, and maybe in severe cases, jaundice, hypotension, and nausea, vomiting, anorexia, diarrhea, and some problems with the kidneys and weakness to the, leading to the muscle cramps and hypothermia. The, the thing that we should do for the liver side casualties, of course, there is decontamination. And there is an antidotal regime, which is called as the British antilobicide, which is antidote for the level site agents. And the main, the common medical treatment or the common the medical first aid for both the master agent and the level site is the 
the good nursing care, good hospital care is important, but the, under the intensive care units. So the local wound, wound cares also should be applied and some antibiotics and other required medical intervention to prevent the casualties from the infection is also important. And fluid replacement treatment and some nutritional support and is also important. And also we have, this is just a multidisciplinary uh, approach for the uh, the chemical warfare injuries. So the, the, the experts from the uh, pulmonary uh, department or from the dermatology department or from the infectious department or from other surgical departments are also uh, invited uh, for the uh, health care of the casualties. And the choking agents, in other words, the lung damaging agents, the, the phosgene is the main uh, types of these choking agents. It's a colorless leg, and when uh, and, uh, it's you can just smell with the fresh the malte. And the reason is the, the permeability uh, the, the, of the alveolar capillary membrane is increased and the plasma leaks into the alveolar system. So the lethal dose is almost too high. So uh, the, the main signs and symptoms, the, the hyperlacrimation and sore throat, chest tightness, and the pulmonary edema and hypotension and, and right ventricular failure and cyanosis and, and the shock. And the the main uh, signs and symptoms are also visible for the, the chlorine uh, chemical warfare agent. And the medical treatment in the first state almost the same here, the respiratory support and decontamination and symptomatic treatment. Or, and of course, the decontamination, especially with the plenty of water and soup also should be applied. And the treatment of the pulmonary edema and burns also uh, taken into consideration. And chlorine gas a chlorine, uh, is one of the most used uh, 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 chemical warfare, especially in the world uh, war, uh, the first world war, and also in Syria conflict. And it's also you know, uh, used in industrial chemicals, industrial chemistry industry, and in today. Uh, to especially produce in the plastics and the lubricants and to purify the water. And it is heavier than the uh, than hair. That's why especially it can just remain in the low-lying areas, in trenches. And the, the most harmful route for the ex of the exposure is, is due to the breathing of the chlorine gas. And the skin contact and the eye contact is also possible with this chlorine agent but the but in the the uh, surprising thing is the chlorine gas it's not on the list of the chemical weapons today and after this uh, the syria conflict so it is just discussed between the countries in the opcw area that uh, is possible to just put this chlorine gas uh into the list of the the schedules which are uh, found and under the Chemical Weapons Convention. But I'm sure that this chlorine threat during the wars will be uh, continuing because of the, it's easy to produce this agent. Also, it is rapidly disseminated and, uh, and also it is rapidly disrupted from the environment. That's why chlorine gas is which is which is named in other words battle bombs is going to be used in our uh future and that's my uh, consideration the signs and the symptoms are almost the same with the phosgene and the treatment is the same and the hypoxia and the, i mean it's the, the same uh for the pulmonary edema and uh, the the treatment is going to be sh it should be under the hospitalization, and the blood agents mainly the, the cyanide, hydrogen cyanide. It is also like the phosgene and the chlorine. It's used in some industrial uh, areas like the metal coating, surface cleaning, jewelry, 
and plastic industry, mining, photography, pesticide industry, fertilizer industry. So it's colorless, volatile agent and has the smell of the bitter almonds. And the, it's toxic symptom, symptoms are mostly because of the central nervous system effect. And the common cause of that is the respiratory depression. So the, the mechanism is, of action is it just forms a reversible complex with cytochrome oxidase enzyme and then it, it interfaces the use of the oxygen within the cell and then the, the cellular hypoxia and the cellular death occurs. And the signs of symptoms are just emerging in a very uh, sudden time like the increase in the death of the breathing and it's weak convulsions, especially after the in a month in a minute uh, after the exposure, and respiratory arrest and cardiac insufficiency also within minutes, and uh, because of the the big difference between the the venous system and the arterial system, the, the lactic acid uh, quantity is increased and the metabolic acidosis, and also is a uh, available uh, uh, for these casualties. And of course, during the laboratory examination, just uh, we can, uh, in the blood testing, we can just see the increased concentration of the cyanide in the blood. And in the treatment, there is an antidote, which is the similar like the delobicide, which is similar like the neuroagents. And this antidotal system is nitrate preparations. And which is composed of the amyl nitrate and sodium nitrate and and sodium thiosulfate and dimethylaminophenol are the, uh, the the main antidotes, the main <clears throat> treatment treating agents to <clears throat> to sorry uh, to give the first aid to the cyanide casualties. Of course, the oxygen the supplement uh, should be. Uh, just administered and, and the, the, uh, the reversing the acidosis is important and also diazepam just to uh, reverse the, the convulsions and just uh, sometimes skin decontamination also should be applied just to, to remove the, uh, the toxic agent from the skin. And hallucinogens or in other uh, main, uh, in other words, the incapacitating agents, uh, and it affects the central nervous system and may cause temporarily um, uh, effect on the behavioral or in the on the physical capacity of the person of the uh, human body. So the person may have uh, stimulating psycho uh, psychological or may have depression psychologically the main depression uh, depression agents is the bz uh, trichinic adenyl benzylate is in another form and lsd is as a stimulant but the bz is still under the use as a chemical warfare agent and their symptoms are because of the cholinergic blocker which is the reverse of the, the nerve agent and in the treatment, these respiratory functions should be taken under control. And there is a big risk for the suicide, for the, for the patient, for the casualty. So that's why we have to observe the patients. And physostigmine as an antidote uh, also uh, can be applied for, these, uh, for the seizures and to improve the, the hallucinations and hypertension and arrhythmia. Uh, so the patient should be removed from the contaminated environment. And as I said before, the patient should be under observation because the patient can uh, can harm himself and, uh, and the others. Of course, uh, this symptomatic treatment is also should be available, especially for the uh, cardiac problems and for the uh, temperature regulations and some urinary problems and right control agents tear gas or vomiting agents are the main uh, subclassifications under this term so they are mainly irritants but they have a very low toxicity and 
because of the contact time, you can get more and more symptoms and signs, especially the conjunctiva is the particular sensitivity to such irritant agents, and they can give the as uh, and they can increase the tear secretion. And the vomitic agents also may uh, irritate the, the nasal and the nasal and the the upper respiratory tract mucosa. The first step is to be should remove the patient from the uh, area, from the toxic area. You have to disrupt, you have to just uh, take off the, the clottings. Of course, there is no specific antidote for that, but the treatment is always uh, supportive or, I mean, symptomatic treatment is available for such patients. Okay, that's just a summary of all this chemical warfare agents, the types and the effects and what kind of treatments, what kind of first aid precautions should be taken for such uh, uh, chemical warfare agents. But the, just I would like to, in the second part, I would like to summarize the, the medical response against a chemical incident, especially in the, in the hospital system. So why it is important, I mean, to give this response. So we can just give this example uh, coming from the the Tokyo subway uh, sarin attack. Uh, it, it occurred in 1995. So just more than 1,600 people which are possibly contaminated are just uh, overwhelming the, the, the hospital, which is very close to the, the incident area. So from this hospital staff, almost the, the one fourth of the hospital staff were exposed to the secondary contact because they didn't know that the, the casualties were uh, already contaminated. And, and the 10% uh, the of the technicians uh, or the first responders also subjected to the uh, secondary contamination in the incident area. So that's why we have to give uh, important importance to this to the response against this chemical warfare agents, and we have to first of all the determine the the threat is it still uh, threatening the environment is it threat threatening the 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 location, and also we have to just uh, keep up our readiness and and. After all this uh, determination, all this uh, understanding, just what what level or which types of level we have to give this response, and that's that's all just giving the causing the a very well preparation against uh, such uh, chemical attacks. Of course, this preparation also should be uh, performed under the hospital administration. And we can just uh, categorize this medical response to a severe attack or to chemical attack as uh, starting from the initial operational response means that there is a preparation phase. So preparedness, the first step. And after that, in any attack, in any incident, so the immediate response, I mean, in the, on the incident side, it is important. And what kind of things should be done after the attack by the hospital or by the health staff, especially to recover the the the, uh, the casualties. So the initial operational response means the preparedness. First of all, we have to create a, a plan, a response planning under the hospital emergency system. The medical teams may be just according to the availability so the a special CBRN or your chemical response team uh, can be established. And also the, the medical equipment and the protective equipment, decom materials, and the drugs and available antidotes should be stocked in advance. And the first then and con unit also should be established, of course, according to the, the resources and the availabilities of the hospitals. And the laboratories also in another uh, issue because we have to just uh, put the diagnosis and also we have to just put the uh, detection what types of uh, agent is used. 
to the laboratory for the identification, like the biochemistry laboratory or the microbiology laboratory should be involved in such a uh, mission to put the diagnosis. And the protection, protection may be because of the individual protection, like the level B, level C suites, or the collective protection, like the shelters or some uh, uh, closed area under the hospital also should be uh, just isolated uh, with, by the administration. And first of all, how we can recognize, how we can detect the chemical and how we can confirm the uh, the casualties is because of the, the chemical warfare agent. And there are some uh, indicators which we can recognize, especially from the event, from the incident site. And there are some certain clinical signs and symptoms uh, that we can recognize from the patients. And we have to get some clues, some uh, evidences uh, from the incident site detection. And of course, the, the last and the, the, the accurate the diagnosis should be also put by means of the laboratory analysis. There are various types of the detection methods, and most of them are widely used, in especially to understand the, the chemical type, to ident identify the chemical agent, especially on the incident site. The point detection where it is used just on in case, like there's some detector papers, some test kits, cam instruments, chemical agent monitor, R cams, and some mobile spectrometries, and some mobile detectors are the main detection methods on the site. And also, also some remotely detection like the spectroscopic methods are also used, especially by the first responders. And in hospital laboratories or some reference laboratories, spectrophotometric methods, for example, lead the nerve agents uh, aff affected uh, cholinesterase uh, activities or the cyanide measurements in the blood is available by means of the spectrophotometric methods. Of course, there are some other types like the biosensors, some chromatographic methods are also available for the laboratory analytical uh, uh, possibilities. And one other thing that the, the staff, the medical staff or the healthcare staff should take their uh, personal protective measures because there is an additional uh, hazard, there is an additional threat and risk that such uh, medical staff should be uh, covered. And that's why also one and a, an important thing is off gassing. I mean, evaporation uh, from this, from the, uh, of this uh, chemical warfare agents from the, the skin itself or from the, the, the uh, clothings is important, so we have to take care of the situation. Of course, some people we, which are also contagious, contaminated with infectious materials also should be isolated in negative pressure uh, cabins. And also wind contamination is important because we cannot expect all, always the, the, uh, the chemical exposures all or without any uh, trauma, but sometimes with the conventional uh, uh, ballistic, uh, conventional metals, conventional blasts also can be combined combined with the chemical injuries. So that's why we have to take care of the wound contamination and and while making the the, the wound the contamination in otherwise we have to prepare the the emergency operation rooms for more surgical interventions. PPE, personal protective equipment, especially, of course, there are uh, different types, level A, B, C, D, suite, but but mainly the healthcare, the, the staff in the hospital should be very well uh, uh, known and should be very well trained about how to, uh, 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 have to cover all this, especially B and C level suites. Of course, the training, as we are, we have been performed many times in our medical faculty, 
the medical people, non medical people, or, or training to trainers and the chemical response team. And of course, this theoretical training should be also uh, contributed with the uh, the exercise, the battlefield exercises or tabletop, tabletop exercises. Any communication, any cooperation, maybe from the national perspective or from the international perspective. But the main thing is we have to be suspicious about the that agent might be a chemical CW agent. Or we have to get, we have to provide the required intelligence uh, reports, uh, what kind of things we have, we can deal. And the indicators are also uh, alerting us and are also increasing our awareness, like the, I mean, the information uh, obtained from the incident side, like the, the what kind of symptoms the victims have, or is it a mass casualty? Is it a uh, massive, or what? How many people are injured, and the pattern of the casualties? Uh, uh, the the symptoms are are increasing according to the downweight. I mean, uh, or are limited to the, some specific enclosing areas. And we have to get the information about that uh, points. Are there any dead animals or the birds around? And the victims' anamnesis or victim statements are important. And is there any unexplained different types of the liquids around? Or did you did you feel any some strange different uh, smells, strange type of smells in the incident side? For so we have to just. As we have to get some notice from the victims uh, in the entrance of the hospital. And of course, on the side, uh, we can just think the side as the, the entrance of the hospital. Uh, we have to detect, we have identified the agent and establish the hot zone. The hot zone may be uh, from the, maybe enlarged from the, let's say, 10 kilometers away and maybe up to the just uh, 50 meters. So it it depends on the severity of the, uh, the of the incident. The first aid measures and the ventilation is of course uh, important, but we don't have to forget the antidotal uh, applications, antidotal administrations. And in the war zone, the main thing just we have to do is the triage and the decontamination uh, before accepting the victims into the interior of the hospital. And the cold zone is namely the cold, I mean, the clean zone. The, we don't have to give the, the permission for any very small contaminated patient uh, to the uh, hot zone, to the hot cold zone, sorry. And we have to evaluate the types and the, the magnitude of the release, I mean, magnitude of the uh, event. And we have to uh, evaluate the the, 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 the the mass casualty needs. And of course, the first responder also should uh, think their uh, protection, should think their self-protection and at the end of the, the medical intervention, they have to just decontaminate themselves before uh, going in, inside the hospital. Triage, no, this is the uh, process uh, to prioritize the casualties. And first of all, let me say that triage is not specified for any zone. It's a dynamic process. So you can just uh, change the degree of the triage degree of the, the classification, the categorization of the casualties of the victims. So if there is T1, I mean, uh, the as you see here, the, the rat tech, so it should, uh, we have just the medical intervention immediately. It is important for the chemical warfare agent casualties because as I said in the beginning of the lecture, say, uh, I said that this is a weapon of mass destruction. So we have to expect just tens of casualties, hundreds of casualties, maybe uh, thousands of casualties. So in that situation, triage is important because 
the casualties may overwhelm our medical assess, overwhelm our medical capabilities. So that's why the, the triage is important for the medical staff. And some important points like the intensive care units should be available uh, to welcome the, the CW agent victims. And <clears throat> the we uh, the the healthcare staff sh should wear the different types of the protective equipment, but it is uh, going to affect uh, badly the their work performance because they are incapacitated, and within this incapacitation they should work. They should give some medical intervention, and the people may need some decontamination, some treatment procedures, protection, and. And all these issues may also need some additional staff. And by wearing this uh, IPEs, individual protective equipment, so the, the staff also have uh, decreased visual and touch senses. And also that makes the, the intervention, that makes the communication difficult. And also, we always have to keep our mind that the the risks risks of the the secondary contamination, and we have to behave accordingly. And of course, triage. I mean, we have to prioritize the casualties. Dr. Some Peter, important... we have just a couple minutes left, so if you yes, wanted to open yes, it up I'm for just... questions, okay. Okay, I'm just about to, yes, yes, terminate. There are clinical investigations like some pneumatological analysis and airway considerations and respiratory considerations and circulatory considerations should be also uh, included in the hospital uh, management system. Like some, uh, as I told you, we need some equipment, and of course, uh, good coordination and cooperation between the, the emergency services and the other hospital units also should be collaborated. The contamination is essential. Removing the, clo removing the clothings makes the approximately most of the decontamination and rest should be removed by means of other decontamination methods. And uh, also we have we shouldn't forget that the, the non-ambulatory patients, the unconscious patients should be decontaminated. And level, level B PPE is the, the minimum uh, ED uh, or minimum uh, type of the personal protection for the decon people. Okay, thank you for listening. Thank you for your patience. If you have any question, and uh, of course it's your turn, uh, Laura. Uh, if you have any questions, please. If you have any questions, you can either ask them in the chat or voice them now. We are at time, um, so we may have to end this here soon, but I will make sure this recording is made available. Um, and Dr. Yeah. Kennard, do you know if you'd like your slides to be made available as well? to yep. viewers that are interested. Okay. Looks like someone said, thank you for a great presentation. You're welcome. I don't see any questions in the chat right now, but if I receive any questions, I will certainly pass them along to you via email yes, as well. Please. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm a, I'm a please on that. Thank you. Yes, of course. Well. Thank you again for everyone for attending this presentation. Um, and thank you, Dr. Kanar, for sharing your work and oh, research. Have a good right. day. Thank you. Yes. Bye-bye.